We're going to continue our work with the life cycle of a star and recall that our sun will have a helium flash about four and a half, five billion years from now. And so, yes, the sun will one day expand and incinerate the Earth. So here's a visual representation of the life cycle of a low mass star. Low mass stars being those that are three times the size of our sun or smaller. You start in the interstellar cloud called the nebula. The hydrogen will start to coalesce and you'll get those protostars, like the pillars of creation in the eagle's nest. Then you'll be a main sequence star like our sun is. Then you have that helium flash and become an enormous red giant and you are then beginning to warm up. So you start to compress and gravitationally collapse on yourself and you warm up so you're a yellow giant. Then you are left with a planetary nebula and a white dwarf after a, an explosion here. We'll look more at these types of explosions on the high mass side. Planetary nebula, the name because astronomers thought they were looking at the beginnings of a planet and that was how planets were formed. But remember, all things in the cosmos, for the most part, began in nebula. So planets aren't actually formed in planetary nebula. What they were seeing and didn't realize was a white dwarf. If we look at the high mass side of your uh, stellar evolution, which is page 36 of your notebook, we had the low mass side here, and now we're running through the high mass side. Screen of death is awesome. I'm just going to leave that techno glitch in the video. So page 36, looking at the high mass side, of course, everything beginning with your nebula. You are going to continue to have protostar. Then you will have a uh, main sequence as you are scintillating. You are fusing your hydrogen into helium. In discussing the low mass side of the life cycle of a star, we looked at hydrogen in an oversimplification of 1 plus 1 is 2, so one hydrogen atom fused with another hydrogen atom yields helium, which is definitely true, but uh, for those of you that want a little more of uh, the details, you are actually going to have uh, the hydrogens uh, collide very high speeds and you're going to end up with a, as it says here, heavy form of hydrogen called deuterium. You also are going to have helium-3 and helium-4. So it is helium, but uh, not necessarily 1 plus 1 is 2, but it works for our class, I think. But this is for my friends who want uh, just a little bit more detail of the hydrogen fusion going on in our sun and other low mass stars. Thus far, your high and low mass stellar evolution has been the same. Nebula to protostar to main sequence. These ones over here is a whole group of dwarfs, and we highlighted the brown dwarf. So brown dwarf over here is if you don't have enough mass to reach that critical 400 million or so degrees Fahrenheit temperature to begin fusing the hydrogen, you just aren't scintillating, not giving off energy. What we have happening on the other side here for stellar evolution is where the stars are so massive, they fuse through their hydrogen at such a rapid rate compared to the stability of a main sequence star that these stars just essentially just through their hydrogen uh, fusion very, very quickly. There's lots of subcategories of giants over here, and because I'm making you memorize these 20 items, I just group them into one thing, just like I group so many different types of dwarfs here into the one brown dwarf category. We're going to do the same thing over here with the stars that just go pfft. So since I was making this chart, I thought, hmm, what can we call these wonderful giants? And I think you'll like the name I went with. I went with the very scientific term of... And uh, there you go. I'm sure you'll see that in all the astronomy textbooks and the IAU International Astronomical Unit will soon adopt that. No doubt about it. Now, just as you run out of 
hydrogen diffuse into helium here and have a helium flash, things are a little bit different after that helium flash in the sense of here you're still a giant. Now you're actually much larger than this circle here, but you see I had to cram a lot more onto this high mass side as we got a couple different options here. So this isn't to scale by any means, any of this to scale. This right here is probably the annoying part on the life cycle because we know this is a red giant and yellow giant. This right here is a yellow giant and it's a different kind of yellow giant here. This one uh, kind of um, pulsates as it goes through this yellow giant stage. And then instead of over here, it's a warming up. What we have is a cooling down. So we go from a yellow giant to a red giant. An example you're familiar with of a red giant is actually Betelgeuse, this star right here. Here's the width of the star of Betelgeuse, a red giant. This is the size of Earth's orbit. So it's the size of Earth, but the size of Earth as it loops around, revolves around the sun. And in comparison, think about how far Jupiter was out when we did the solar system walk. This is the orbit of Jupiter. So sun in the center as the Jupiter planet goes all the way around the sun and the size of the stars bigger than Jupiter's orbit. Very magnificent size. Then we have a super giant. It's an actual term. I have seen it sometimes as one word. So lowercase g there. And supergiants are 15 times more massive than our sun. And each star has a diameter of about a half a billion miles, half a billion miles. Low mass stars are able to fuse to carbon and then they needed more energy, which is mass, more mass to continue the fusion process. The high mass stars are able to fuse to the element of iron. So in order to take the iron and fuse with another iron atom, that requires more energy, more mass. And so iron is actually kind of detrimental to high mass stars. You have weapons of mass destruction in your homes. If you do Dutch oven cooking, have cast iron skillets in your kitchens, toss that skillet the way of a supergiant and it will explode. And thus the element of iron, Iron Man indeed. The symbol Fe, capital F, lowercase e, is from the Latin of ferris. So a little chemistry humor your way here. You are looking at a ferris wheel. Hey, I didn't guarantee the chemistry humor would be hilarious, but you'll be using that on your friends in chemistry if you haven't already had chemistry. So this massive explosion that occurs is a supernova. There's a supernova here that'll take you from this yellow giant to planetary nebula. But there are very, there are very different types of supernovas, type one, type two. And uh, again, because I make you memorize this, I just limited to you to this massive supernova here. Spiral galaxies produce supernova about one every hundred years. In a human lifespan, that seems like hardly any supernova, whereas you consider billions and billions of years, this is actually fairly common of an event in an astronomical term. Zooming in to a supernova, a stellar puke, as I sometimes think of it, although uh, much more energetic and powerful. Core collapsing supernovas produce a brilliant visual outburst very different to puke, that can be as intense as the light of several billion suns. Am I the only one who looks up a beetle just every clear night and thinks, just explode already? Now we hear the term explosion, and in astronomy it's not like uh, two vehicles collide, bam, explosion. This is an animated GIF showing you the time frame of this continued explosion of a supergiant. So starting back here in December of 2000, moving up or 2002, moving on up to May. Here's a legendary supernova. 
legendary probably because in the time frame of humanity, we were able to capture images of this supernova. Supernovas are named very creatively, the year of their discovery, and the first one of the year would be A. So the second supernova to be discovered in 1987 would be called 1987B. And there's no question as to whether you have seen a supernova occur. So here's the night before. The next evening, definitely something massive happened there. So massive, it makes the cover of Time magazine. Magazines like stamps we've just discussed in this class, they're still around and kind of wondering how long they'll be around for, maybe two years. And uh, the Time magazine, Time is actually an acronym here. It stands for the International Magazine of Events. And so this is a great accomplishment if you're able to make it as the central cover of Time magazine. With the advent of the Hubble in the uh, space telescope realm, it was launched in 1990. And of course, the supernova would be a point of interest. So you can see in the late 90s, so about a decade or so later, what this supernova looks like. And of course, uh, the next thing we're going to look at on the life cycle of a star on the high mass side is, okay, what do we have going on here in the center? It's not a white dwarf we're on the high mass side here. And this is data taken from the Hubble over a couple of years. And then just glimpse, 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 glimpse from 94 to 2003. This image also reminds us of explosion in astronomical terms. It's not like the two vehicles hit each other. Moment of impact we call maybe an explosion. Pieces go flying. An explosion of a supernova is something that continues and continues. You can see this evolution of the supernova over this time frame. Putting Supernova 1987A into a little bit of perspective, it's located in the Large Magellanic Cloud, our neighboring galaxy. It's about 170,000 light years away from our Milky Way galaxy. So think about this uh, core collapse detonation of a star. It's about 20 times as massive as our sun. It occurred 170,000 years before February 1987. Let's see how good of supernova hunters you are. Now, there were certainly many supernova between 1987 and 2011 that were detected, but uh, just pulling these images for you to view. The image on the left is actually the night after. This image on the right is the one before. Yep, it's right there. Well done, right there. And you can see before is what's happening here. And one of those false color images that we've discussed in astronomy, looking at this celestial object now. The supernova there, 2012A, is, uh, I think the arrow probably gives it away, of right there. Slightly more recent one is 2014 in M82. This is a galaxy. The M classification is for the Messier catalog of galaxies. So you have the NGC number, which is the new general catalog that Sir William Herschel started and the IAU continues to add to. And then there are these just about 100 Messier objects of Charles Messier from France, who at the same time as Herschel was also cataloging galaxies. And there was not social media at the time for one of Messier's friends to say, hey, look at this great work my friend is doing. And that somehow reached the United Kingdom and England where Herschel's friends could say, hey, I think someone in France is doing something similar. You should collaborate. Of course, having the English person and the French person collaborate would have been a bigger event than the supernovas being uh, observed, possibly. So we have the before image and the, yep, right there, a supernova event. You can actually view this supernova. It is just above, a little bit above and to the right of the Big Dipper pointer stars. Rather than the pointer stars taking to Polaris, you detour a little bit here. And uh, here's an animated GIF showing you the beautiful shot covering before and after overlaid on each other. 
Definitely a great day at work as an astronomer going over the uh, data from the night before. And there's that supernova. We go to our classic T. copulus, actually Sagittarius, but the uh, teapot nova right here, and nova meaning new. And this is a 2015 supernova. Another very well-known supernova is the Edicarina, and this is uh, famous in the sense that I see this a lot as a page in a calendar for one of the months or desktop wallpaper. The supernova events are incredibly energetic. Uh, they are one of the most energetic events that uh, the universe can experience. And I normally like to show you how energetic the supernova events are using these bouncy balls, where this one is attached to this stick. This one is also uh, threaded through the stick, and this one as well. And then this red bouncy ball, which we use to be our scale of our M-class stars, if you remember, and the sun, a G-type star, about grapefruit size. This one, where if I hold the stick and actually hold it upright, so this is uh, vertical this way, tip it a little bit to the right, I would hold this up pretty high, let it drop to the ground. The impact with the ground right here would cause the energy transfer to travel up through here. And then since this one isn't attached to the stick, is free to move, it's going to accelerate quickly off this. And it is quite chaotic in the classroom. Um, I haven't done it at Ridgeline yet because the ceilings are perfect. And if I put these little divots into the ceiling, I've been the only one that occupies room 101 and they would know it was me that damaged the ceiling with the bouncy ball. We don't take you outside because I don't have the budget to lose uh, several hundred bouncy balls each trimester. So instead, what we're going to do is put you in the great hands of the YouTuber who goes by the physics girl. Check out how high these different balls bounce. The basketball, the super bouncy ball, and the golf ball. Now I'm going to try the golf ball on top of the bouncy ball on top of the basketball. And then I'm going to explain how it's related to a supernova. Did you see that? Probably not. So here it is again. The golf ball bounced to 28 feet. We dropped it from about three and a half feet, so it went up 800% of its dropped height. In fact, if you consider that by itself, the golf ball bounces about 70% of its dropped height, it went as high as if it had fallen from 40 feet up. That is awesome. So how can we get the golf ball to bounce up with that much energy? Let's simplify it to these two balls. When you drop them individually, each ball starts out with some potential energy from the height of the drop. As the balls hit the ground, some energy goes into heating up the ground and some goes into heating the ball. Because that energy left the ball system, you can't get back up to the same height. But when you combine them, the tennis ball goes higher than its dropped height. Way higher. Where does it get the extra energy? As the basketball bounces, it compresses, storing elastic potential energy. As it releases, it springboards the tennis ball upward just at the right moment. This is like the double bounce on a trampoline when you jump right before someone else. You prepare the elastic of the trampoline by stretching it and storing energy, which can then bounce the jumper even higher. In the same way, the basketball stores energy in its compression and is able to push the tennis ball. But just like the double bounce preparer, the basketball can't go as high. You can see that here. It bounces even less when three balls are dropped together. Also, during that transfer of energy, some momentum transfers from the basketball to the tennis ball. And since the basketball starts with way more momentum because of its larger mass, the tennis ball's velocity increases by a lot and it flies up, up and away. Now back to the triple super ball bounce. Now you get the energy from the basketball's bounce being transferred into the bounce of the super bouncy ball, which is then transferred to the golf ball's bounce. You put the same amount of energy or momentum from two more massive objects into a smaller object and it will go much faster. 
epic. Just like the explosions of a supernova, which may seem unrelated, but what we just did is analogous to the process that occurs during the explosion of a supernova. Just like our more massive basketball transfers momentum to the smaller balls, energy from the dense core of the supernova is transferred in a shock wave that moves through the star to the less dense layers and accelerates them outward at a super high velocity. More massive or denser layers in the core of the supernova begin to collapse when fusion stops there. The collapse is halted when the neutrons in the core actually touch, sort of. This causes the implosion to rebound and bounce outward. You end up with a dense core left behind and these wild outer shells of star exploding outward. Pretty cool. And of course, if you try this at home, which you should, you have to make sure the balls are perfectly vertically aligned because any off-centeredness gets amplified by the two points of contact, which is why we sadly couldn't get the quadruple tower of balls to work. But if you put a little ring of hot glue or something similar on the balls, it helps to balance them. Happy physicsing! With safety glasses, if you try that at home. Safety first and always. All right, you're going to take a writing instrument and you're going to make an arrow from the supernova back to the nebula. Don't go onto the table here. Let's stick it on the paper itself. The reason you're doing this is because of the full circle of life we have here with stellar evolution. So I've mentioned how the nebula will have the hydrogen start to coalesce, and it's actually the shock waves of the supernova explosions, that energy that actually stirs up the hydrogen in neighboring nebula. And these supernovas are that powerful to disrupt hydrogen, get it going, and coalescing into those pillars. So here you can see this rectangle, zoom in here from the Hubble, or excuse me, the Spitzer Space Telescope. Right here, you can see that push of the hydrogen, these shock fronts that are a result of supernova. A supernova explosion produces more energy in its first 10 seconds than the sun during the whole of its 10 billion year lifetime. And that for a brief period, it creates more energy than the rest of a galaxy put together. Galaxies have trillions of stars, hundreds of billions of stars. So truly indeed a supernova. So if we look at the periodic table, organize a way of looking at their elements by atomic mass, hydrogen, that first element, one and one, producing your helium. Your low mass stars confuse to carbon. High mass stars, as you know, confuse to iron. These higher elements in our uh, cosmos, such things we adore like gold and silver, these are the result of a supernova because of that enormous energy. Think of that golf ball bouncing off the basketball super bouncy ball combination. They cause so much energy, so much of those shock waves, so much of the beginnings of further fusion that we're able to get these higher metals. So the time that our solar system is being created, of course, that's happening in a nebula as our sun, as Sol, is coalescing, getting all the hydrogen to begin that critical fusing of uh, hydrogen into the helium, it's also kicking out the dirt and rocky debris forming our planets. And as this stage is happening, neighboring, we have supernova occurring, and those uh, shock waves can create the fusion process to add that energy, add that mass, so that the supernovas can then result in fusion of higher elements, and those higher elements sprinkle, shower down on Earth during its formation, which is why we go mining, we go digging into the Earth's crust for things like silver, gold, diamonds. So definitely long live the heavy elements. Original Cosmos series that Carl Sagan put together, he pointed out to us that every atom of iron in our blood was produced in a star which blew up about 10 billion years ago. We have jewelry you may have jewelry on you right now that's gold, silver. 
you may have silver fillings, you may have silver gold crowns, and uh, that's material that was the result of a death of a high mass star. A quote from the Cosmos series by Carl Sagan, the nitrogen in our DNA, the calcium in our teeth, the iron in our blood, the carbon in our apple pies were made in the interiors of collapsing stars. We are made of star stuff. And he became synonymous with that uh, term, that 100% star stuff. That's us. And quite appropriately, he made it to the cover of Time magazine, Showman of Science. In the Physics Girl clip, she mentioned how the supernova explosion is going to result in these um, neutrons being pressed up against neutrons to that uh, remnant core. And so a neutron pressed right up against a neutron, pressed up right against another neutron, or essentially atomic nuclei pressed against atomic nuclei, you end up with one of the absolute most densest celestial objects and the most spherical objects because of the fact that you are compressing nucleus of an atom against another nucleus of an atom and that gravitational pull gets you a perfect sphere of these neutron stars. And then you have, if you write in this space here, the supernova remnants. It's kind of, if you were to think of it, how we were looking at planetary nebula with the central core white dwarf. Here, the neutron star, very small. You're not able to pick it out within these images of supernova remnants, which we'll show you here. So you're writing supernova remnants plus supernova remnants. There's some supernova remnants. This is NGC 6995. Neutron stars got their name because their extremely intense gravity squishes together the charged particles, protons, electrons, and merges almost all of them into uncharged neutrons. Furthermore, deep inside neutron stars, the nuclei are crushed so tightly that the neutrons and protons arrange themselves into an exotic state that resembles pasta shapes. Variations of nuclear pasta Cited in research papers include gnocchi, spaghetti, lasagna, and pen phases. We showed you this earlier with the low mass life cycle, white dwarfs about the size of planet Earth. And down here, similar to scale, is the neutron star. Much, much smaller and incredibly dense. The neutron star is about city size. It's a neutron star compared to Manhattan or the city of New York, rather. These uh, neutron stars are so small, about 10 to 15 miles uh, in diameter. They're three times heavier than our sun, and probably about a billion neutron stars in our Milky Way galaxy. They, of course, come from supernova explosions, so bright they can briefly equal all other light in the sky. Roughly 100 million neutron stars are believed to inhabit our Milky Way galaxy. 100 million, 1 billion. And based on how many stars we uh, think are going to have gone supernova, and so far found about 2,000. So information from the Perimeter Institute, uh, one of the greatest theoretical physics uh, think tanks in the world, in Canada. In 2009, researchers found evidence for a thin carbon atmosphere surrounding the neutron star in the Cassiopeia A supernova remnant. The atmosphere is only 10 centimeters thick, having been compressed by the neutron star's gravity, a hundred billion times stronger than at Earth's surface. So your pressure, gravitational attraction on a neutron star is uh, that many times the atmospheric pressure here on Earth. I don't know why, but uh, if you dropped your phone from one meter above the surface of a neutron star, of course this is all based on the mathematics, it would land at a speed of 2,000 kilometers per second. If the impact didn't destroy the phone, which it would, the 600,000 degrees Kelvin temperature scale would finish it off. A chunk of neutron star the size of a sugar cube would contain roughly the same mass as all of humanity, all seven and a half, eight billion of us. 
Hence, we think of neutron stars as a teaspoon of a neutron star weighing more than everyone on Earth combined. The great NDT likes to pipe in with social media comments about the science in movies. If Thor's hammer is made of a neutron star matter, implied by legend, then it weighs as much as a herd of 300 billion elephants. 300 billion, with a B, elephants. That's some power. Some images of the supernova remnants, and somewhere within there is the neutron star, so we definitely go with our standby of, it's right there. Where's the neutron star? Yep, right there. And right there. The Tycho Brahe, or Tycho Brahe supernova remnant, as detected by the Spitzer Space Telescope, and composites with uh, Chandra as well. And let's just take a uh, little field trip into supernova remnant 0509. No bake sales necessary or massive amount of field trip permission forms for this field trip. Magnificent. Now, before we go further down this side and this side, it's being covered by the arrow here, before we go and wrap up the high mass life cycle of a star, we do need to take a bit of a detour. Mention that to you at the beginning of this life cycle uh, path here. Take a little detour, give you a little bit more astronomical science under your belt to fully understand and more so for you to understand the answers to questions you're likely going to ask me about these types of celestial bodies.